promises or pledges that take us maybe to 2.7 degrees. That's their reference technology scenario. <coughs> and then going from that, because that still doesn't meet 2 degrees C, does it? To get down to 2 degrees C, the role of the energy technologies in achieving that. CCS has an even larger role. And then, of course, Paris asked to pursue 1.5. So they've taken a well below 2 degrees uh, scenario <coughs> that is about 1.75 degrees. And going that extra effort, that's the role of the different energy technologies. And CCS has to do even more of this heavy lifting now, 32% of that contribution. And that, um, you know, already we are seeking to have a carbon neutral power sector. And they're looking at 2060 now. So already decarbonized power by then under the two degrees C scenario, but the well below two degrees C scenario, we've got to go much further because we need to address those remaining emissions from the industrial sectors and any remaining in the power sector. So industry also must be carbon neutral and that means the power sector now has actually got to go into carbon negative through the use of bio CCS. So that was a quick scene setting. CCS has been uh, quite active in the UNFCCC environment, mainly building up to COP17 in 2011 when CCS was agreed to be in the clean development mechanism with a set of modalities and procedures designed to keep CCS projects uh, safe and operable in developing countries. Um, so that was my quick uh, introduction. What's next for CCS really? Well, uh, we have the NDCs that some of those list CCS and countries will be revising those uh, as we know. We also have the long-term greenhouse gas strategies for the mid-term, mid-century. There are six of those now submitted by countries and five of those have got CCS in. And of course, we have the IPCC 1.5 special report that's underway at the moment, building towards uh, its input to AR6, but will be published itself October next year. And we expect to see that CCS being addressed in that as well. So it gives me great pleasure today to uh, introduce our panel to you. Um, we have um, a group of leading, world leading experts in their fields, and they're here to share their knowledge and their experience and their enthusiasm for their fields with you and their passion. Uh, we have Dr. Carol Turley from Plymouth Marine Laboratories. Um, we have da uh, Professor David Alexander from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Catherine Romanak from the University of Texas. Mike Muneer from the International CCS Knowledge Center in Canada. Um, Gia Lippestad, the Vice Mayor in Oslo, Norway. <coughs> and uh, Jonas Helseth was due here from Bologna, but he's caught on a train. So we have Keith Wiriski in his place to present on infrastructure. And last but not least, Clara Huberger from Imperial College uh, on the interface with renewables. And hopefully you will see as we go through these um, how they flow together and the points there that are relevant to oceans and small island states. So with that, uh, I will now invite up Dr. Carol Turley, OBE, to present on an update on ocean acidification. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure being here um, at a CCS event, at a COP where a small island developing state has the presidency. And I'll be talking about the oceans and really why um, we, we have to do CCS as well as every other form of uh, energy transformation. And what I'll be talking about is ocean acidification and the need to reduce CO2 emissions. And I hope by the end of this, you will see that there is a need. So CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing. The ocean is taking that up, and this results in a change in ocean pH. And this is what ocean acidification is all about. So when CO2 enters the ocean, it's a natural means of taking up CO2, it reacts with water and forms carbonic acid. It's a mild acid. 
Um, the ocean has already taken up 27% of the CO2 that we've emitted so far, and more will enter the ocean. So it's reducing uh, atmospheric warming by taking up the ocean, but it's causing ocean acidification. But it's not all about uh, a change in pH. There's a whole load of chemical reactions that go on that I'm not going to go into great detail. Um, and they result in um, an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration, which is what pH is a measure of, and an increase in the bicarbonate ions, and importantly as well, a decrease in the carbonate ion concentration. And this is very important for things in the ocean that produce shells and skeletons out of calcium carbonate. And I'll come back that, to that in a minute. So this is a global model of aragonite, which is a calcium carbonate ion, that uh, things like uh, uh, coral reefs uh, use to make their skeletons. And you can see ocean acidification is happening now, and it will continue happening, and uh, it will be, the severity of what's happening will depend on our CO2 emissions. This is a business as usual scenario, and you'll see that um, the orange, the white and orange areas are where, where um, the aragonite concentrations or saturation states will be so low that unprotected shells will actually dissolve. But you'll also see that even in the tropics, there's this really large reduction in the saturation state. And of course, coral reefs are used to very high saturation states, so there will be impacts there as well. Um, scientists over the last 10 years have been doing hundreds exper of experiments to try and find out what species are vulnerable. And here's just a, a, a summary of a meta-analysis that uh, looked at, at, at those that were vulnerable and those that were um, resilient to ocean acidification, or, or in fact might do well. The ones in green, um, actually with the extra CO2 bicarbonate there, they do well. The run ones in red do extremely badly and they are mainly calcifiers. You may know or not that the, there are, as well as tropical coral reefs, there are cold water corals, and these occur generally in deep waters um, and um, out of the sunlight. And these are, they're, they're nearly as well uh, distributed around the world as, as tropical reefs. They, um, these are around the ones indicated around our sh shores, um, uh, European shores, and you'll see on, on the, the, the um, different scenarios from present up to business as usual of aragonite saturation state in the bottom waters, which is where they grow. And you can see how that corrosive water will spread the more CO2 we put in the atmosphere, basically. Um, and corals, actually, cold water corals grow on the bones of their skeletons. that the, These reef-like substances aren't actually living. They've got a little bit of life on top, which are the living ones, but the rest is a 3D city made up of bones, old bones. But these are enormously important habitats for fish, nursery grounds, and our biodiversity hot, hot spots, believe it or not. So they are really uh, vulnerable to ocean acidification. Another example is the potato chip of the ocean, and that's this little mollusk called a, a pteropod or a sea butterfly. And um, it's, you can just see it by the naked eye, and it's really important link between the things at the bottom of the food chain, which they eat, to the things at the top, such as salmon, whales, fish, herring, all eat these. And they are already being impacted. They're dissolving. The shells are dissolving um, off the coast of California and areas in the Southern Ocean. Economic impacts are already happening. They're harder to define, but there is one really good case study of the oyster hatcheries of the Pacific Northwest, and they found that ocean acidification was causing 90% 80-90% mortality of their little baby oysters, the larvae that they then sell on to oyster growers. And they eventually traced it down to upwelling water that had high CO2 from 
um, atmospheric uh, um, input. And they have been able to adapt um, by measuring the inflowing water and then controlling it, but they know that is a short-term adaptation and quite costly. So are NDCs not enough? I think you'll see here in green, present day, the change in seawater sea temperature is um, about one degree centigrade. The change in pH is around 0.1, which doesn't sound a lot, but that's around 26% change because pH is on a logarithmic scale. Business as usual is totally unacceptable. Three degree mean global temperature change in, in the ocean and um, a 120 to 150% uh, change in uh, ocean acidification with the 0.4. You can see the NDCs are, are around 2, 2.5 degree warming or um, around 0.3 of a pH change. It's not enough. So we need to do better. And if you look at coral reef ecosystems, there's one off Papua New Guinea, which is a wonderful experimental site for scientists because there's CO2 venting through these coral reefs. So there's a natural transect of pH um, along this. And you can see at 8.1, today's pH in the ocean, wonderful, diverse, um, complex coral reefs as you go down the spectrum to, to 7.9, there's a loss of biodiversity. The reefs aren't so complex. And at 7.8, which is what will happen that by the end of the century under business as usual, you can see the beach, that, that there's very poor biodiversity, very poor complexity, and there's a lot of overgrowth by coral algae. If you take warming, because the oceans are warming too, and acidification together, you can see that the risk is very high um, for business as usual and still very high with the current NDCs. So I'm just finishing now. So a nod, more than a nod to the SIDS. Impacts will be strongest in coastal communities, especially those that are vulnerable and depend on marine pro productivity for food and coastal protection for uh, their, their, their survival. So that's it. Many thanks. So, so we have time for uh, any quick questions of clarification. We will be having questions at the end, but after each speaker there will be time for any qu short questions of clarification. And if there are no questions for Carol. Sorry, I can't see. Oh, yes, in the middle. Sorry, it's hard to see with the lights. So. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't really get that. Um, I think just because I was writing something down. But um, what was the the difference between like the impacts of acidification alone and acidification in combination with warming? Because I didn't really get the difference. Well. That's a, a thank you for asking that question because the ocean is warming as well. It's taking a, up over 90% of the heat energy um, from global warming. So it's at the front line in terms of warming, but also of CO2. It's taking up CO2. So that warming is, what if you look at corals, we, we know that as coral bleaching. And so the coral bleaching in combination with ocean acidification is really a very, very high risk for um, coral reefs in the future. Is Thank that you. clear? Yes. Thank you, Carol. So can we have, yes, thank you very much. So um, just a quick then response to that. So obviously we want to put, we want to stop putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere because it's going into the oceans and having the effects that Dr. Turley describes. So the London Convention is the marine treaty that protects the marine environment from dumping at sea. It's a good 
treaty. It works. It stopped the dumping of nasty industrial wastes. It's got uh, 87 countries in the main part of it and 49 countries in the new protocol. Um, and because um, putting CO2 into the sub-seabed is strictly technically dumping the CO2, it was prohibited by the London Protocol. But they um, realized this was a climate change technology that could be of value. Um, and so they uh, started looking at the case around what should they allow CO2 storage in sub-seabed formations. And they, they work through, they're a UN body, and they have a scientific group, which is a bit like SUBSTA and IPCC, and they set a task to their scientific group to look at the risks and the benefits of doing CO2 geological storage beneath the seabed. And they produced a risk assessment framework. In looking at the risks and the benefits, they realized, and this is an old slide of Carroll's from 2005, but this is the time of the work that was undertaken. They realized the impact of the CO2 from the atmosphere, the extra CO2 that man's put in the atmosphere, the impact on that on the oceans was so significant that it shocked them, to be honest. And what could they do about it? Well, one low carbon technology was asking for some assistance. And so they produced an amendment to allow CO2 storage in subseabed formations. Uh, there's lots of conditions that come along with that. They produce uh, CO2-specific guidelines, and they um, are uh, an environmental protection process to follow. Just to mention also, London, Con London Convention is global. OSPAR is the Northeast Atlantic version of that. That followed the London Convention as well, quickly to allow CO2 geological storage. And both London and OSPAR have produced guidelines for risk assessment and management. And this is basically an environmental impact process that regulators have to follow in issuing a permit for CO2 geological storage offshore. Therefore, we have the London Convention's response uh, was to allow CO2 storage, but put these conditions in place to ensure that it's done in an environmentally sound way. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. I see no questions, so we'll move on to uh, our next speaker, which is David Alexander, from, uh, who's an assistant professor at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and he's going to join us by Skype. Do you want to do the actual... Um Hi, David. Hi. We have you, and we're getting your slides up now. Okay. Um, did, the, did the audio work on yes, the, on the yes, PowerPoint? Yes, you're, you're at the COP now. Give, uh, so we, we have, I don't know, maybe 100 people in the audience. David, uh, can all hear you? Um, they will okay. see your slides, and I, I will progress your slides uh, if you tell me when to progress. Oh, look, he's on. Or you can progress if you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have your name, your first slide up now, David. Okay. Um, just hold one sec. Okay. Should I begin? Yes, please begin. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Alexander, and I'm from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, today my talk is entitled, The Potential of CCS in Trinidad and Tobago. On my agenda, I will give you an indication of where Trinidad and Tobago is located, the impact of climate change on the Caribbean and Trinidad, uh, the results of an inventory that we have done at the university, um, for carbon capture in Trinidad and Tobago, our main storage sites of interest, uh, some basic modeling results that we have done, and the way forward for Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. So Trinidad and Tobago is the most southerly of the Caribbean islands. If you look carefully uh, to your right, um, you will see us. Trinidad and Tobago is a very small island 
located just about 6.8 miles off the northeastern coast of Venezuela. Um, we are also bounded by maritime borders of Grenada and Guyana. If you could say next slide, please, David. Okay, next slide. We are on slide four. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so we are all by now acquainted with the charts that show the correlation between the rising surface air temperature and CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And we have enough scientific evidence to believe that this has some impact on climate change. Um, slide five. To yep. give an example of the effects of climate change on the Caribbean, uh, here in slide five we see the devastating effects of Hurricane Maria on the island of Dominica. Uh, this happened on the 21st of September this year. And currently, when uh, estimates of the damage was done on the island, 90% of the island was decimated. Next slide. The same hurricane, uh, Maria, hit Puerto Rico and it marooned many people in their houses. And when an estimated cost of damages was done, um, it, it ranged from 20 to 90, 90 billion US dollars. Um, so you could see the devastating effects on the, on the smaller islands um, due to more frequent hurricane passing through the Caribbean. And so just prior to Maria, the Caribbean experienced um, two other hurricanes of same intensity, Jose and Lee. And so what we have seen in the recent times is a frequency of more powerful storms forming in the Atlantic. Next slide, slide seven. Um, this is a picture of, um, although we didn't get hit by any hurricane, uh, the changes in rainfall pattern has caused a lot of flooding in Trinidad and Tobago. So what we are seeing there is our capital city being flooded out and the bus cannot go um, into the city and persons are walking through the water. Next slide. Um, on the southern side of the island, we are seeing that the flooding basically covered all the roads and even encroached into houses. Um, there were millions of, of dollars in, in losses in furniture and damage to houses, etc. Slide nine. For us in the Caribbean, climate change affects our food security since crops get watered out, uh, infrastructures are damaged, and the cost to repair are generally phenomenally. It's very expensive and it takes many years to get back on track. Slide 10. At the University of Trinidad and Tobago, we have deep interest into carbon capture and storage. Uh, so the first thing that we did is we did a recent greenhouse gas inventory. And what the results have shown is that in 2015, Trinidad and Tobago emitted 45 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions where 80 percent emanated from the petrochemical and power sectors. Slide 11. 80 percent of the greenhouse gas in the petrochemical sector originated from our ammonia and methanol plants. Slide 12. And in, within the power sector, most of the greenhouse gas emissions originated from the industrial consumption. So generally for us, we have really good point sources uh, for our CO2 emissions. Slide 13. Um, when we did an analysis, a further analysis, um, Trinidad and Tobago has 1.3 million people and we have, and because of our emissions, we are second in terms of emission per capita. And this has inspired us as a nation to do something about it. Hence, although we are less than 1% by absolute emissions, we want to pursue research that can be implemented on a global scale so that it can help from the impact of greenhouse gases. Slide 14. So again, for us, 
the best sources of CO2 for any project, carbon capture and storage projects, are from our ammonia plants, since we'll have a, a, a pure stream, and also from our LNG plants. So we have at least 5 million metric tons per annum for these projects. Slide 15. Um, we basically don't believe that ocean sequestration is safe and reliable because there are no traps. And although terrestrial sequestration is one of the safest methods, um, our islands are too small to be able to capture all of the CO2 that we emit. So as you can see from the basic calculation, even if all of Trinidad and Tobago were covered by tropical rainforest, we could only sequester 5.5 million metric tons. Slide 16. So for us, our target areas for CCS are deep saline aquifers and our depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Slide 17. Um, a basic stu case study that we did uh, on a field of short Trinidad with these parameters yielded the results in slide 18, um, which showed that even after 500 years, there weren't much migration of CO2 that we uh, injected in the storage area. So it means that this is good prospects for us in, in storing carbon dioxide. Uh, slide 19. So the way forward for Trinidad and Tobago is for us to do capacity building at our educational institutes. Uh, we need to do workshops, public awareness. And as a small island, we need to look for international partnerships where we can do really good research on storage capacity and probably a couple demonstration projects. But for now, our goal will be to uh, be, have climate change adoption policies, have disaster management in place, and look for sustainable development. So thank you all, and if you all have any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander. That was very good and very good on time as well. So um, I will ask the audience for questions, and they, I will relay those to you uh, if we do have any. So does anybody sure. have any question, questions for Dr. David Alexander? Yes, so uh, could we have the mic to the middle, please? Hi, David. Uh, that was a great talk. Could you just go again through the 500 years slide on CO2 storage? I, I missed... Can you hear that, David, or shall I say the 500 years year slide? Could you just go yes. through that again? So okay. That, which number slide was that? It was 17 and 18. 17 and 18. Yeah, I didn't want to um, go through too much of the, uh, the reservoir data and petrophysical data for the, uh, res um, the case okay. study. But basically what we have done is we have looked at an area where there, there is very low population is on the southeast coast of Trinidad and we worked with the company BP and we simulated what would happen with if we injected carbon dioxide into one of their larger aquifers from a depleted reservoir that they have and so generally um, those reservoirs uh, are really good traps for carbon dioxide sequestration because they have stored the hydrocarbon for hundreds of years, or even millions of years, I should say. And we just wanted to see what would happen if we injected carbon dioxide into the same reservoir. So on slide 18, yep. basically what, what we are seeing there is that we are filled one of so those reservoirs basically have sand shale sequences so we injected in one of the lower sands and what we have seen is that even though the reservoir has faulting in there because it's characterized as sealing um, even after 500 years there weren't much migration of the buoyant co2 uh, that was injected into the reservoir okay thank you very much david and we had one other question in the middle, or, uh, sorry, yes, there was one over in the middle. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Um, the question was just on, do you have any estimates on your um, CO2 storage potential? Because you said you know what emissions you have, but uh, how much storage potential there is. So do you have any estimates on your storage potential? 
with the question. So, that, that, so that's the tricky part for us. We don't have the estimates on our storage potential, but that's one of the projects that we want to, to do next. We, can, we estimated our CO2 emissions by sectors, and now we want to move on to estimating our storage capacity throughout the country, whether it be offshore or onshore. So that's a project that we want to start in the near term. Okay, thank you. One last question then. Thank you, Daniel Klingenfeld from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Uh, my question is whether the CCS studies here are rather an add-on to existing more or less fossil fuel extractive activities or can be also seen in a broader context of transformation. Thank you. So did you hear the question, David? Do no, they, I didn't. Do, do they add on to the existing oil and gas activities or are they part of a, a wider transformation of the energy and uh, emissions of Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, so, so to be honest, for us, initially it has to latch on to the current oil and gas industry, um, simply because it's, if we want to start CCS in Trinidad and Tobago, it will be so capital intensive that we won't be able to afford it. But if we latch it on to our enhanced oil recovery processes, um, it will, there will be a win-win system if we use a closed-loop system. So initially, we'll have to look at CO2 in, uh, in um, oil and gas reservoirs. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Alexander, thank you very much. And it's, on, it's 5 a.m. in the morning there. So thank you very much <laughs> for getting up and presenting to us today. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. So now can I next invite up Dr. Catherine Romanak to share with us the latest work from the US um, on CO2 storage and offshore. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Tim, and thank you, everyone, for being here again. I'm Catherine, Dr. Catherine Romanak from the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm going to briefly share with you our experience in monitoring, because I think this is one of the um, advantages, actually, for um, small island developing nations in, and the oceans, is that when we do CCS projects, as Tim mentioned, we do extensive environmental monitoring above these projects. So this is an additional benefit for doing um, CCS in the offshore environment. Um, and for those of you who may be feeling like um, CCS is new, it's really not. We've been studying now, uh, monitoring uh, for CCS sites now for 15 years at the Gulf Coast Carbon Center. And um, what we do is we develop and implement monitoring programs for CCS sites. So as my colleague Tim said, you know, there's a lot of permitting that's involved. Um, we have to do the right site selection. And then once the project begins, we have to monitor everywhere from the very deep reservoir all the way up to the environment. And this is what we do, and this is what we're experts in. Um, the, the experience that we have stems mostly from the U.S. Department of Energy Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnerships. This was what the, um, what the United States did, was they took their different regions, the different geological formations in the United States and Canada, and they divvied it up into, uh, into uh, seven different sections, and then they went on a multi-year plan of characterizing the potential storage formations, doing small-scale pilot testing, and now we are up to industrial-scale projects. And the experience that we've had through one of our um, southwest, uh, southeastern carbon partnerships is, is an evolution of experience that stems from the very small pilots where we injected 500 tons into a saline aquifer, and then we scaled up to start to really um, try to understand what types of monitoring tools and techniques that can be used, and um, all the way up to uh, industrial scale projects, including the largest project that is now operating in Texas, which is storing 1.6 million tons per year. 
so the learnings that we've gotten through all of this experience is that this works. Um, geologic CO2 storage works. You put CO2 in a deep geological formation and it stays there. And we know how to show that it stays there. And we know how to monitor to ensure that it stays there. Um, we've monitored over 4 million tons of CO2 through the CCARB project and through all the USDOE partnership projects, we've, um, which are six large-scale projects, we have monitored 10 million tons of CO2 being stored into deep geological formations. So we've had all of this experience onshore, and now what we want to do is understand that the offshore geologic formations are huge and they give us a, a great potential for gigaton scale storage. So we can, you know, the, the geological formation doesn't care if it's got land above it or if it's got sea above it. So we are looking to, um, to the offshore deep geological formations as well. And I, again, I think that one of the benefits here is that we monitor the environment. We monitor all the parameters in the marine environment to ensure that the CO2 is staying where we put it. So this is an additional benefit to small island nations is that we will be gathering additional data on the marine environment in, in that area, wherever CCS is happening. So kind of an invitation to countries who may be here um, looking to think about the potential in their countries. We are building a community of countries that are interested in exploring their, um, their potential for CCS. And so, um, we're looking at the specific opportunities. We've already held workshops, and we're going to be having uh, future opportunities as well. So please, if you're from a country and you're interested in exploring CCS, please come to our booth. It's, it's uh, shown there. We have a booth. And also, we'll have a reception afterwards, which uh, just please come and talk to us. Um, we just, uh, yeah, we want to share our experience with you. And we want to also let you know that, of course, the, the new United Nations funding mechanisms are coming online. So as David said, they're looking to build their capacity. The United Nations is supporting, um, is supporting building capacity in CCS. So again, please talk to us and, uh, and join, join the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, any questions for Catherine? One right over there. Oh, thanks, Tom. Hi. Um, can you talk about the the potential for induced seismic activity um, with this process, and also the potential for leaking? Okay. So, is this clarification? You want to do this now? Okay. Okay. So, yes, we were studying all of those things uh, very heavily, and um, what we do for to uh, to avoid induced seismicity is we, we know the pressures that the reservoir can handle and we make sure that we don't go above those pressures. So that is monitored as well and it is built into the operation of the project. And then as far as the leak leakage question goes, um, again, we, the sites that we choose have to be permitted and they have to make sure that they have ceiling formations above them. So, you know, the, the first method of environmental protection is finding the right site, making sure that you're finding the right site. And then, uh, and then we monitor, and of all the millions of tons that we have stored, we've not, we don't have leakage. So we, we do monitor that to make sure it doesn't happen, and we haven't seen it. So that's, that's how we avoid that as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I must thank uh, Doctor. Um, my name is uh, Musa Sow. I'm coming from West Africa, a country called Gambia. Um, doctor, having listened to your presentation, uh, you did mention that uh, you build communities uh, across countries. Like, for example, um, if you look at the, the climate, uh, the impact. Basically, Africa is one of those uh, continents that are really you know, hard hit. Yes. So um, have you tried a similar offshore and onshore program for Africa? <laughs> if you have, if you have um, what were the, um, basically the challenges and, and the procedures that one yes. needs to follow 
Yes. To, 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 to at least um, benefit from uh, such a program. Well, I, I'm just very grateful for that question. That's a fabulous question. And um, as you know, uh, last year's COP was in Marrakesh, and we were focusing on Africa at that COP. And we have an amazing new colleague um, from Nigeria. Her name is Felicia Mogo, and we were hoping she could be here today. But she actually has um, done the work to start looking at CCS in her country. So we absolutely would love to talk to you more about the, the processes that you go through. And she is leading this in Nigeria. And so this has already been stimulated in Nigeria. And we are happy to work with you, know, with you or any other partners to, to start you on that path as well. So please come in and see us afterwards. That sounds like a good point yeah. for conversation after the uh, side event, which reminds me we do have teas and coffees available afterwards as well. So I encourage you to stay and, and talk. So with that, we better move on as time is pressing. Thank you very much for those questions. And now can I invite up Mike Munier from the International CCS Knowledge Center in Canada to give us some update on the knowledge sharing from his center. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Tim. My name is Mike Monia with the uh, International Knowledge Centre of Canada. Uh, we um, have built a plant, the world's first plant, to clean up a hydrocarbon as a, as a power company. The power company, SAS Power in Canada, had to decide if they could keep coal in its fleet or did it have to go to 100% renewables, which was uh, impractical for the climate in, in Canada. So what happened is that uh, I was very fortunate to be on this project, to build this project, so we built a capture plant that shows how you can take a transitional fuel like coal to maximize your renewables, which is hugely important. So that plant is uh, in Estevan, Saskatchewan. I, I welcome anybody to come up and tour that plant. We'd like to show you uh, what we've done. There's many challenges with cleaning up a, a fossil fuel like coal. But the important thing is to reduce the emissions of these plants, as it, which will give us time to uh, have a cleaner fuel source for power, which is needed around the world in each country. And one thing I want to say also is that even though, not even though, but this, this COP conference is oceans and small islands, and Canada's not an island, or we've got oceans far away from this plant, but we have the Arctic, and the Arctic is being hugely impacted by climate. And that's where we think we have a link with the islands because it's like the canary in the coal mine. The Ar Arctic in the north and the islands in the south are really vulnerable to these swings now with the uh, climate. So this is a technology that shows you can reduce large point sources of emissions. And I think it's hugely important. But please remember, we need everything. And we need to maximize renewables, which what th this is what this plant did. The organization that my colleague and I represent today is a nonprofit organization, and it's built to advance CCS globally. And how we do that is we take the learnings and the challenges that we have from that plant, and we basically go around the world teaching people what we've done and what we could do better in the future. And we use networks in order to tell our story. A global Institute from Australia, who are here today, and also the IAGHD are perfect formats for the engineers and scientists to show what we're doing in carbon capture and storage because the technology does work. It needs improvement, but storage works, as my colleague Catherine Romanak said, but you have to do things right. And we need everything, all kinds of energy in order to uh, be very successful. We also are collaborating with China, which is hugely important. Uh, China is going to be a big mover in order to improve the, the conditions that they have. So. We're, we are linking up with the uh, Chinese corporations and trying to teach them about regulation and policy, which is uh, some of the first things that you need to understand before you can implement CCS at the level that we're starting to see. This slide shows how clean this plant can be. Uh, we take out the PM10s, the PM2.5 to 70%, 100% of the SO2 and 90% of the CO2, and we sell those products, not the particulates. 
we sell fly ash, we sell whatever we can to make the economics of these plants work. Because this being the world's first plant means it's also the world's most expensive plant or the world's cheapest plant, whatever you want to think about the world's pl first plant being. So we try to reduce the, the overall economics by selling whatever products we can. And then we look at conversion so that perhaps in small islands that don't have storage, we can look at conversion to make products like calcium carbonate or other things that you can use CO2 for. The plant is very clean, uh, a lignite plant, which has many impurities in it, which gives us experience and expertise to uh, work in other industrial sources. We go from 1,100 tons per gigawatt hour down to a regulation in Canada of 420 tons for any new plant. The Boundary Dam plant is cleaner than natural gas for CO2 emissions by three to four times, roughly 120 to 140 tons per gigawatt hour. And you can see here that there, there's so many industrial sources that need help for capturing CO2 and these other products. And if we, as engineers and scientists, can clean up a lignite coal, we can certainly clean up cement plant emissions or metallurgical plants or whatever there are in these small islands that need to try and reduce and reduce the, the greenhouse gases that they have in future. Because what we believe is that, take Fiji for example, has their NDCs that, that are going to be lived up to. But what happens at the next level? And at the next level we need to do these deeper cuts in order to not just meet requirements because to reduce the amount of CO2 and these greenhouse gas emissions in order to to re help our climate, you have to do it all. You have to maximize the renewables, but you have to also take whatever you're using as a transition fuel and really reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And this team that we have up here is a very good example of where we are today. So Tim, I'm gonna leave it at that and see if there are a few questions. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Mike. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Mike? There's one hand up quickly in the middle there. Can we have the mics on, please? <coughs> we reduce, yeah, certainly. The question is uh, what, what, who buys our products? Actually, the nitrous oxide is a reduction that we have. Uh, the uh, sulfuric acid, or SO2 is made into sulfuric acid, but we also have a plant that wants pure uh, sulfur uh, in a liquid form, so I would have liked that because building an acid plant took a lot of work. CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery, which ultimately ends into storage, and we also have a stored site, and thanks for bringing up this question, a pure storage site in a saline reservoir that is, uh, I think, one of the top uh, storage sites in the world, which we could use Catherine's help making sure it's monitored properly. Okay, thank you very much. And question over there. Um, hello, I'm Mona Simi from Germany, um, Climates and International Think and Do Tank. Um, I have a question to you um, regarding renewables. You have strengthened several times, but we also need renewables, and I wanted to ask you about the political landscape in Canada and why you're not accelerating renewables and putting so much um, energy in the CCS technologies. <coughs> the every jurisdiction is different around the world, but uh, the example that I'll give you is in Canada and Saskatchewan. Right now, our renewables are low, probably 12 to 18 percent wind, hydro, uh, what that, that's, and the company is trying to move to 40% in by 2030, 40% renewables, even to 50%. But as a power company, there is no power company in the world that is, does not have to balance that power portfolio. If you go to renewables too quickly, and, and it depends on your climate, your grid becomes unstable, and your baseload power that's, that's needed in order to keep the lights on all the time, uh, it becomes less reliable as a power source when you have, when you maximize the renewables. So there's a balancing act and that's what we're trying to educate companies on is that maximize your renewables but keep your grid stable. Okay, thank you very much. With that we better draw to an end but we will have time at right. the end for more questions and we'll have teas and coffees afterwards as well and we do get more detail on that topic. Thank you very much Mike again. You're welcome. Tim.
I love this movie. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you have uh, are doing well. Uh, my name is Gerdi Pesta, and I'm the vice mayor of Oslo, and my responsibility is uh, public ownership and business development. And I will talk to you now in a, couple of mi in a few minutes uh, how we practically work in Oslo now to, to capture CO2. But first, a little bit about Oslo and our climate goals. The city has developed and uh, adopted uh, the Oslo Climate and Energy Strategy in accordance with the Paris Agreement. The target in Oslo is to cut greenhouse gas emission by 50% by 2022 and by 95% by 2030. And the goal is zero greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emission in Oslo by 2050. These are demanding yet achievable goals as long as we make the right zero emission choices. The city of Oslo strives to be a leading force in the green transformation and we recently awarded the European Green Capital of 2019. For many years, the city of Oslo has invested in a waste management system based on recycling sorting at source, material uh, recycling, and energy recovery of reducible waste in Oslo. I, and all this contribute to a better utilization of waste resources, a better climate, and a better air quality for all of us living in Oslo. Recovered heat from waste incineration is used to produce electricity in, uh, and district heating which in turn help us phase out fossil fuels for heating purpose and reduce stress on the electricity grid during the coldest days. In Oslo, there are lots of cold days. It also provides capacity for more electric vehicles in our streets. And as you probably know, there are lots of electrical uh, vehicles in our streets in those days. These are important measures to make the city greener and a better place to live. And now the next step. The next step in Oslo's green waste cycle will be to reduce CO2 emission from waste incineration. The largest individual point source of CO2 emission in the city of Oslo is the waste to energy plant at Glemister. That was the plant that you uh, viewed in this movie. Uh, it's owned by the company Fortum and it's also owned by the city of Oslo, 50-50%. In 2016, Passibility studies uh, on CO2 capture were completed at, Clep at uh, Clemens Room and two other industrial plants 
as part in the Norwegian government's ambition to realize at least one full-scale CO2 capture plant in Norway by 2022. The test at Klemensrud were successful <clears throat> and shown it is possible to capture up to 90% of the CO2 emission from the plants. Since then, the company has prepared and submitted uh, its concept report to the state, describing how CO2 capture can be realized at Clemens in Oslo and what are the expected cost, costs. The concept report and the correspondi corresponding report from the other industrial actors will form the basis for the governmental overall assessment of the CSS project and which and which of the industrial actors that will be invited to continue the competition for the realization of a full scale CSS facility. <clears throat> if realized, CO2 capture at Klemser will reduce CO2 emission in Oslo by 400,000 tons per year. Since much of the CO2 capture will come from biological waste, the plant will also be a CO2 negative, actually removing CO2 from the atmosphere. This makes the project in Oslo unique and a key initiative in order to meet Norway's commitment to climate uh, according, uh, according the, uh, to the Paris Agreement. CO2 capture at Lemsu can become a model for cities around the world. There are 450 waste to energy plants only here in Europe. And with 82 million tons of waste incinerated yearly, it is an extensive source of CO2 emission. Worse, however, 98 million tons of waste is still deposited on landfills every year within the European Union. Globally, landfills are one of the major challenges concerning people's health, the environment, and of course, the climate. In order to succeed in establishing a better circular waste economy, <clears throat> and reducing global CO2 emission, the, the world must move from landfills to material recycling and waste incineration with CO2 capture. The transfer value from CO2 capture at Klemsru will make it possible for many more plants, both in Norway and internationally, to capture CO2 from waste incineration. This will create, I believe, a new industry new green jobs, and utilize national uh, resources in a new way. CO2 capture and storage is stated by the UN Climate Panel as necessary to limit the global warming to two degrees Celsius. No, Norway and Oslo have an excellent, excellent opportunity to lead by example, not only globally, not only locally, but also globally. We are more than willing to share to share our uh, knowledge about this technology. However, the realization of full-scale CO2 capture and storage change in Norway is dependent on um, the necessary will from will and sufficient resourcing being provided by the government. So I have a close, uh, we have a close uh, dialogue with the government and I hope that we can see the results in 2022. Thank you. Any questions for Gia? There's a fast hand at the back there. Yes, <coughs> lady there. Thing one, two, three. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm just interested in sort of the sustainability of the model um, of waste to energy and then of course waste to energy to CO2 in, in two respects. Um, one, with respect, I mean, I'm. I'm assuming that you're relying also on imported waste for your facility and I mean I'm I'm cognizant of the fact that the EU has now a circular economy directive and the push is actually now towards more recycling and reuse as opposed to burning. And so if you the more moves we make toward the circular economy it seems that the the business model of a burning waste instead of recycling waste particularly as you're saying that like there's 450 waste to energy plants only in Europe. So, so what's sort of the long-term business model in, in conjunction with the circular economy drive? Um, and then si along similar lines, I mean, you can, you can burn biological waste or you can incorporate biological waste into the soil. And a lot of the conversation around um, 
negative emissions and also in the intersection with agriculture is that we need to be taking more of our carbon and putting it back into soil as opposed to burning it. So I, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the the business model and the sustainability of that model in, in those two what um, a long question. situations. I, I, I can try to answer, but remember, I'm just a politician <laughs> and, and a lawyer. So, so I, my, my, I'm not an engineer, but I, try to, to, I can try to answer the question. The, the last part of, uh, part of the question, we are, we are planning to deposit the CO2, the, the CO2 capture in, in the North Sea. Uh, we have there lots of, uh, lots of um, as you know, uh, oil industry, and we're using the empty oil, uh, uh, oil fields to, to, to capture and, and to store the, the CO2. Uh, the, business, um, um, the business, uh, yes, the, today Oslo import um, waste from, from the UK, and, and, and <laughs> that's, uh, that's a weird thing. I think that we have a lot. We have lots of waste uh, in, in Norway. We can use the waste um, that we have there to, to burn that. But today, we, we import some of the waste that we burn in, in Clemens from, from the UK. So I'm, I can't answer any more questions about you know, the industry in the European level. Uh, I'm not into that. The, my, my, um, my goal as a politician is in Norway is that we have a zero emission from this uh, plant uh, and, uh, and that we achieve that in 2022 and that we can export this technology all over the world and that we, uh, and all the landfills, all the landfills uh, of, 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 uh, of garbage all over the, all of the world ca can start to be, um, to be um, uh, produced in a better way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, one quick question, if is, is yeah. it a quick one? It's a quick one, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was wondering because Oslo, of course, is a, is a city and uh, I think I imagine that it's quite good feasible to to like um, warm houses by a closed landfill in in a city. Um, I, for example, come from a more rural area, and I was wondering if that's feasible if, as well. If you have like small villages around a landfill, and how how infrastructure? Do you think that's also possible? In these kinds of yeah, I think it's possible. As I mentioned, we, we import waste that we're burning Clemson from from the UK. So 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 it's of course uh, it's not only f in the cities and and, and uh, in the city areas. I think this can be d done, of course, in other areas too. Uh, I think it's even better to do it in other areas if you can transport waste in a climate friendly way uh, from from the cities out to to in other areas that we can burn it there where we can burn it. Thank you very much for Thank that. Thank you. Um, Geir will be around for questions afterwards as well. And, and I think that Norway do follow the European co other countries in the reduce, uh, reuse uh, of waste, and then anything left, reduce the emissions from that as well. So let me take the video off. Can I invite up now um, Keith Ruriski from Bologna? Uh, we, you have Jonas uh, Helseth on your programs, but Jonas was unavailable to attend because of transport. So we're very fortunate to have Keith presenting uh, in his place on CO2 infrastructure needs. Thank you, Keith. Over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Keith Wersky. I'm from the uh, Norwegian Environmental NGO, the Bologna Foundation. Um, and I want to talk to you about um, reducing CO2 emissions rapidly and in line with the 1.5 and a 2 degree target. And uh, I want to maybe bring in some other aspects that we haven't talked about so much, uh, and namely industrial decarbonization and reducing CO2 emissions from industry. So I think by the end of this two weeks, we're going to be sick of graphs like this. This shows us that we have to reduce CO2 exceptionally rapidly. And the point being that there is no CO2 that's too important to go in the atmosphere. We, we can't be in a position where we can dump CO2 in the atmosphere. There isn't any room for that anymore. But at the same time, it's not just a climate change debate. We also have to build a new society. We have an urbanizing population. We have to increase efficiency. We have to increase education and the outcomes for people across the world. So not only do we have to rebuild our society in a low carbon way, but we have to build a new low carbon society. And this requires inputs. And often these are industrial inputs. 
So industry is actually a very significant uh, contributor to climate change generally. So this graph here shows us that about 21% of overall GHG emissions come from industry. So this is the, the normal stuff, you know, like, like steel. So steel is interesting because the, the CO2 isn't directly related to just burning fossil fuels for energy. The fossil fuels in steel are used to, uh, a, as a chemical reaction to produce the steel from iron ore. Then we have cement, the second most used material in the whole planet after water. Um, this CO2 is actually not, ma the majority of the CO2 produced during cement isn't also from fossil fuels. Again, it's due to a chemical reaction when you're actually making clinker from limestone. So focusing only on fossil fuels will not solve either of these problems. And these are huge, huge industries that contribute to our daily lives. And also, they're going to help us build our future. If we're going to rebuild our cities, build lots of renewables, and expand out everything we do, we're going to need inputs. And the point being is that we can't decarbonize the world unless we decarbonize the industrial inputs into our decarbonized world. So we just have to keep an eye on industry and how we do that. Uh, as with everything on climate change, there's a million reports and everything. I think we could fill this entire room of reports on how to decarbonize industry. There's thousands of ways to do it. We can reduce the products we use. We can use less steel. We can use less cement. We can change the products we use. We can uh, build constructions with wood. We can change um, cement with other clinker materials. But in the end, we still need a portion of carbon capture and storage because we still have so much materials we're going to use and it's impossible to change everything in the time we're going to do it. So, uh, so I've been working carbon capture and storage for, for many years now and I'm originally I'm a geologist. And carbon capture and storage is, is exceptionally simple. You have a problem, let's say here on the left we have a, a cement plant. Uh, we can transport the CO2 from that cement plant by barge, ship, or pipeline and then we put it, uh, put it in a CO2 storage site. And th th it's very straightforward, really, as a, as a concept. Uh, but when you look at the actual investment timelines and how would you go about doing this in reality, you first have to find your CO2 storage site. Uh, we heard that it's you have to find the right storage site. You have to make sure you have a storage site that is safe, secure. And this takes time. You want to do this correctly and you want to map things correctly. And then when you know where your storage site is, then you can start developing transport. And then, then you can look into where your CO2 will come from because we don't have any sh sh <laughs> shortage of point sources of CO2. Also, a thing that's kind of become more important recently is that we need to share the infrastructure. We have, if we share where the CO2 is transported, instead of building many pipes, if we have a shared network that brings CO2 to shared CO2 storage sites, it actually reduces the cost a lot and it makes it much easier for more uh, industrial players and more CO2 point sources to be connected into that network. So again, back to Norway a little bit. Here we have uh, uh, three industries that are in line to have full-scale capture. So on the left, we have the uh, waste to energy plant. In the middle is uh, Norway's only cement plant. And then we have Yara, which is a uh, ammonia fertilizer production. The interesting thing is here is that uh, having a single transport and storage network can serve all of these. And they all perhaps won't have um, uh, CCS, or maybe some of the industries won't be needed in the future. But having the transport and storage changes the conversation. No longer can these companies say, I, I have a CO2 problem and I can't solve it. Now there is a minimum thing that they can do. There is no CO2 that has to be dumped in the atmosphere because now we have a way of stopping it. So just to go on to a little practical level about how we talk about decarbonization of industry more generally. So in Europe and in many other parts of the world, we talk about carbon pricing. And carbon pricing can be very effective, but when dealing with something like building a CO2 transport and storage network, will it give us what we want in the time we want? And will it give a way out for industry to decarbonize at, a, at an acceptable cost? So the issue we have is that as you have a rising price signal, you have to wait for the price to get quite high before you reach the, the barrier to make investments in transport and storage. And then the issue is that you only do this behind schedule. So only when the price gets to a point that you're s is suitably high, then you start looking for your storage, which of course engenders delay. And that means more CO2 in the atmosphere for longer. And then you also have the issues that if we have only a CO2 price, then you're not going to get shared networks developing. And this is the biggest way of reducing costs and the easiest way of getting more emitters to stop emitting. So in the long term, focusing only on a CO2 price and not having parallel policies to start developing transport and storage means that it'll be bad for industry. How are they meant to be compatible in a zero carbon world if they don't see a pathway to actually reducing their emissions drastically? And it's also bad for the people who work in these industries. And of course, it's bad for climate. If we don't have a solution, the CO2 will continue to go in the atmosphere. So I would like to, I would like to get people more excited about building CO2 transport and storage infrastructure because it's a tool that enables us to talk more realistically about getting to zero CO2. 
we can build networks that uh, are shared between MATI emitters to reduce cost. Uh, that means we can lower the price that we need CO2 to be at to get to a zero carbon economy because we can reduce the overall cost of decarbonization. And I want to talk a little bit about the Ruhr. So we're on the edge here of Europe's largest industrial cluster. So we can see that there's a huge steel, steel mill right over the road. I think they have a uh, free allocation for about 16 million tons of CO2 a year. We have waste incinerator, we have cement, we have lime, and we have some refineries. And what is the plan to decarbonize the Ruhr at the moment? There isn't one. People don't talk about it. It's difficult. I would like people to get more serious about a pathway to decarbonize these sectors and decarbonize them quickly. Because as I said, we have to get to zero CO2 sooner than later. So I would like people in this region to talk about what jobs they want to have in the future and talk with their neighbors about how they can start developing storage in the North Sea, how they can start developing transport to the North Sea, and how then they can start looking for places to capture all that CO2 because we have too much of it and we have to start capturing it now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. That's very good. And uh, any questions for Keith? Yeah, one at the front there, thanks. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, my concern basically is uh, when I have looked at uh, um, in your presentation, you said 24% of 24% uh, of uh, the CO2 is coming from agriculture, forestry, and land-related uh, programs. Um, but then, in the you said, uh, what do you do is uh, you trying to capture um, the CO2. But then, basically, looking at uh, what is presented, if 24% of the CO2 is coming from agriculture-related programs, why why couldn't we uh, promote uh, a more friendly, you know, energy uh, energy uh, generation sites? Like, wh why couldn't we use uh, the shun? Why didn't we use uh, 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 the windmill? Mm. You understand? Because I'm sure Europe is not for far from Africa. And it costs nothing to to get the energy, probably, you know, from the shun and windmill. Why do we only have to look at capturing the CO2 and not wanting to have natural kind of a thing that probably will reduce? We don't want to only capture, but we want to reduce the emission. I think that's basically the, 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 the truth. And that um, looking into into that too, you begin to understand that um, you know um, you know what what is or what kind of a plan does Europe have to kind of probably promote regeneration? Mm. If naturally, if the trees can really consume the CO2 that is produced, you know, naturally, I think that is more sustainable than than the industrial aspect. I'm sure even the industrial aspect probably in the long run will also have side effects. You know, what is your role on that? It's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, I think we can clearly say that we have a hundred problems and we need a thousand solutions. And uh, I would never say that CCS is a replacement for any other thing. We have to do everything that we have available to us. Um, I was focusing more on industrial emissions. So of course, when you're right, when we're talking about uh, electricity generation and efficiency, these are all massively important and renewables can contribute hugely to that. Um, but uh, it's very difficult to make a cement, a cement plant. Actually, it's impossible to make a cement plant powered only by renewables. It doesn't affect the CO2 emissions of the cement directly because that comes from a chemical reaction. You either have to replace the cement or reduce its use, or use CCS. So you have more limited tools available to you to really deeply decarbonize some of these industrial sectors. And there's also a timing issue as well. We need to do this quite quickly because if we get to 2050 and we've already blown our carbon budget, then it's a regrettable situation to say that we've destroyed the planet, but we can't unwind that. It won't be possible. Um, but I would definitely say that we would need all possible solutions, wherever we can use them to get CO2 down in time. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm afraid we have to move on for time reasons now, but thank you again, Keith, for the very good presentation. <laughs> and, and now can I invite uh, uh, Clara Huberger to talk about CCS and renewables and the complexities of that interface. Thanks, Clara. Okay, hello everyone. Yes, I'm Clara from Imperial College, um, and I'll talk about how CCS actually supports renewables in, in the power sector context. So there are three key messages that I want to want to convey today. So the first is that technologies have to be 
uh, have, have a different value depending on which system we're actually integrating them to. The second one is that CCS-equipped power plants can indeed support and balance renewables in the power sector in a very cost-effective way. And the third one is that the earlier we start investments into low-carbon technologies, um, which is CCS, but also renewables and other forms of energy, the better we can go, go into this transition and the, the more cost-effective uh, we can, we can um, move on. So this introduction slide might come a bit late, but um, I guess we're in the middle of an energy transition right now. We're moving from a world where we had mostly large dispatchable power plants, large utility firms to a world where there are much more smaller, more distributed kind of energy generation forms where the consumers also interact with the power grid in a different way than we have before. Um, if we think about how we cho choose technologies, how we understand which ones are valuable, which technology is a good, good investment or not, we've usually looked at a metric which is called the, the LCE or the levelized cost of electricity, which basically looks at the cost of a power plant, the lifetime cost levelized over the power output of this plant. This used to be a, an okay metric to compare different technologies that provide similar kind of services. It was widely used and it's pretty easy to calculate, but it doesn't capture the different services that a technology provides, and it doesn't actually look at how the technology is integrated into a system. So another way of looking at, looking at technology or evaluating them is what I would call a, a system value metric. So we actually understand how, this, how those technologies integrate and interact with the different technologies in the system. Um, so what I would just like to emphasize here that we kind of have to move away from just the looking at the cost of the technologies to understanding the values they can provide. If we think about the potential value that CCS equipped power plants can provide, um, we can look at this sort of in this energy trilemma kind of framework. So we want to reduce carbon emissions, we want to do this in the most cost effective way, and of course we want to maintain the security of supply, the security of, of uh, the power grid, which was touched upon earlier. So CCS can actually tackle all those three dimensions. So first of all, it removes CO2 from power and industry or, and other sectors. It does this, it has been proven many times in many different reports. In, in the lowest cost way, so it actually is our momentarily cheapest option to decarbonize those very sectors. And additionally, because it is sort of a conventional, traditional dispatchable power plant, it provides also other uh, grid services. So it provides ancillary service to balance frequency and, and voltage, um, which many intermittent renewables cannot actually do. So the flexibility of CCS power plants, so how they can operate in the power grid is key to, um, to decarbonize the system in the most cost effective way. So we see here, um, this is a sort of a unit commitment kind of graph where we see how different power generating technologies operate in, in the grid and how they meet the demand at different moments in time. We see that there's a relatively stable um, nuclear power generation and there are lots of intermittent renewables, lots of wind here, and sort of the, the brown grayish parts there the CCS plants then are flexible and then can ramp up and down very quickly to balance between the sort of relatively stiff and firm generation and between this very volatile or intermittent generation of intermittent renewables. So that is really uh, the main feature here of CCS. If we think about pathways that exclude CCS, um, we, can, we can think of two, two possible main outcomes which are both not, not very favorable here. So if we try to really fully decarbonize the power system and we do this without CCS, we could see that we would probably have to increase overall capacity by over two and a half times. So we're looking here at capacity stack from 2015 and to moving on to 2050 to decarbonize the world, thinking about um, demand increase and price changes, et cetera. And we see that really we need to build much more capacity, mainly built up by um, wind and solar here, to, to meet the same demands that we are today. If we do a decarbonization without CCS and we sort of uh, follow a market-driven approach, so we just have a carbon price or something that tries to decarbonize the power system, um, we can see that we are not actually low carbon. So we enter a, enter a world where we have lots more capacity, we have excluded CCS, and we're not actually decarbonizing the power system here. So the third point that I wanted to touch on is, is when should we start? And I think the answer is quite clear. We have to start as soon as possible. Um, what I'm showing here are two different cost curves of, of a decarbonization pathway. The black curve is sort of the, the go now. Let's, let's start to deploy advanced intermittent renewable technologies. Let's start to deploy CCS, uh, bioenergy, storage technology, et cetera. And we see obviously there is a cost increase associated with that. Then the, the orange curve is the wait curve where we actually 
don't go ahead, don't build CCS, we don't build bioenergy and CCS and, and advanced uh, intermittent renewable technologies, we only do this decarbonization with wind and solar energy technologies that are available today. And we see that this ends up with in a much more costly system. So um, thinking about the previous slide as well, either if we, if we wait on other options that come along and don't go ahead and deploy CCS, we could end up in a either much more costly system or in a system where it's not at all decarbonized. Yeah, I'm already concluding. So I'm just showing these slides, th th these points here again. So technologies have to be evaluated in the system. They're integrated too, and we can't just compare them on their cost basis or looking at them individually. Um, CCS power plants can be key to support renewable generation in, in the power system. And the earlier we start investing in those kind of technologies, the easier and the more cost effective this transition can be. So thank you for this, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you Clara. Yes, uh, so questions. I think the first hand up was the one right at the back. Thanks a lot for a great presentation. Um, the question I've got is about your conclusions. How robust are they with respect to um, storage costs or flexibility options. If you look at power systems where industry offers a lot more flexibility to the power system, we have a bit more storage, do you still see such a big role for CCS in the power sector? Um, so, so I'm only obviously looking at the power sector here. I'm not looking at the interface with the indus industrial sector. But I would say yes. I would say the results are very robust indeed. So um, the case studies here were, were at the UK on the UK power system actually. and. The, the, there is some pumped hydro storage, there are some other ways of, of storing electricity, but in fact there is not that much more potential for this. So it is a very wind-rich country, there is a lot of intermittent sources, and there is not much capacity at the moment to balance that, to balance that intermittent generation. So yes, indeed, I see a great value there for CCS, which is sort of the only low-carbon and dispatchable option at the moment. Thanks. And uh, one uh, question at the front. Yeah, yeah. Make this the last question for you. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, thank you. My name is Michael Small. I'm from Canada. This is a question that could go to anybody in the panel, but I'll direct it to you since you're last. Uh, CCS is clearly technically feasible and environmentally necessary. Why hasn't it happened at the degree of scale? I mean, the world's been talking about this for more than a decade. It's been implemented in the Gulf Coast and Texas, as we've already said, but it's not even remotely at the scale that, that's required, and there's been very little discussion on the economics of actually getting there. I mean, you made a simple graph, which is important, that cost does not equal value. But, I mean, are we going to be coming to COPS 10 years from now and hearing presentations about how great this is and it's still not present in any important way in the international economy? I, I, can, I can try to answer and then the, the panel can jump in. But, um, so this is not my part, my expertise, obviously, like why we haven't deployed yet, but I think that CCS is not, it's not the most easy technology, obviously. There are a lot of parts to it. So I think the key problem so far has been really this transportation and, and the, the key part in between. So, so Peter has touched on this. So transportation is the first thing that sort of has to happen for others to jump in and, and then deploy that network. So obviously as we get going, it's much easier for others to plug into the network. But I think this is one of the key points where it, why it hasn't really been deployed large scale yet. Um, yeah. And, uh, and you can guess the, 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 the answer to this is policy. I mean, we haven't had the policies in place to stimulate CCS. It's different to other low-carbon energy technologies, which are more scalable than the uh, smaller scale versions, pilot versions. You need to build larger. And it involves different industry sectors. It's not just one sector like power. It involves uh, organizations with expertise in transport and storage as well. Mm. So you've got different business models, different internal rates of return having to come together. The fact that we've got the projects we've got is quite good. We've achieved those. They're showing that they work and that the business models can work. But you're absolutely right. We need to do a hell of a lot more than what we've got. So we're at the stage now of showing that it works, but we need you know, a vast multiple of the numbers now to build if we're going to achieve anything uh, like the Paris Agreement targets, ambitions. Mm. Okay, Clara, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we are actually at the end of the time of the session, so I'll just wrap up, but the speakers will be available outside for any further discussion, if that's okay with everybody. We've got teas and coffees outside as well. Um, we did hope to have a general discussion session, but we've actually got up to the time, and I think the mics go off.
pretty soon. So, so just to wrap up then, um, so we people think about climate change, but we've got to think about the oceans as well. And Carol, uh, Dr. Turley has given us a very good reminder of the impacts of, on the oceans of CO2, of that CO2 that man is putting into the atmosphere. So we need to stop putting it in the atmosphere, reduce the amounts being put into the atmosphere, and also consider removing it from the atmosphere. And CCS can play a role in all of that. And we've seen the marine treaty that protects the marine environment, recognizing that you can do CO2 storage even in the marine environment in an environmentally safe way. Um, <coughs> We've seen from the other presenters that the te technology is available now. We've got the projects demonstrating it. We've got uh, uh, city bodies moving forward with it. We've got nations moving forward with it. We've got organizations moving forward with it. And its relevance to small island developing countries. Well, one example was Tr Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, they, they're not typical in that they do have uh, their industry there that's established. But all small island states, not just in terms of the uh, impact, but in terms of their future NDCs, will have to look at their industrial emissions. They're making bold uh, moves at the moment to decarbonize their electricity supply, which is great, but beyond power supply, beyond electricity, there are in the industrial sectors that have been pointed out so well that will have to decarbonize in future NDCs, and CCS is the way to do that. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the panel for their excellent presentations, and, they, and thank you, the audience, for coming along and asking such good questions as well. Thank you very much.